Welcome to this uh, webinar at Donald with Avey. It's a walk up uh, King's Seat Hill in the Ockles. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us here tonight. It's uh, talk will take about, maybe about uh, 40 minutes, uh, some questions and answers uh, at the end of it, and uh, we'll see uh, how it goes. Uh, the chat box is uh, disabled at the minute, so if you've got any questions you want to give, give put to me if you just put them in the question and answer box which you'll see on the the menu bar and i'll do my best to answer them probably at the end uh, rather than go along uh, giving the talk but uh, we'll see how what questions you've got for me uh, if you haven't guessed already i'm david black and i'm mountaineering scotland's uh, access and conservation officer and I'm here to give you a virtual walk up uh, King Seat Hill. If you don't know who Mountaineering Scotland is, we are the national representative body and membership organisation for hill walkers, climbers, mountaineers, snow sport tourers who live in Scotland or who come and enjoy Scotland's mountains. We've got nearly 15,000 members and we encourage participation in all these activities and progression too, because we promote safety, uh, skills and self-reliance, we campaign to safeguard access rights, responsibilities, and we seek to protect Scotland's magnificent mountain landscapes from insensitive development. Now, a few caveats and disclaimers, first of all, in this talk. Firstly, this is a succession of slides that follow the path up the hill. It's not a GoPro or drone video stream, much as I would love to have the tech to do that, so you need to bear with me. And secondly, I apologise in advance for the quality of some of the slides. As we all know, when we go into the hills, we take what we get from light and weather, and this virtual excursion is no different. So, to get started, it's uh, King Seat Hill. This is a view from the path as we walk up through the Ockles to the summit of King Seat Hill. And if you don't know where the Ockles are, if you're not resident in Scotland, or if you've never actually visited the Ockles, they're that big range of hills just to the east of Stirling in central Scotland. Uh, it's a fine uh, ridge of hills and they're very prominent. I don't think you can miss them. They're very noticeable, come rising pretty sheer out of the, the, the plain. So this is a view from the path. Uh, one Sunday morning in late January. Now you'll see the snow here. The snow is mostly gone now. Uh, so this is a sort of a more historical perspective when I was actually up on the hill. Guidebooks tell you the path to follow, how to navigate the obstacles and all your potential wrong turns and whatnot, and an indication of the roughness of the terrain you walk through. But uh, this excursion is more of an example of looking, seeing and appreciating the landscape it's from the grand view as you stand there taking in the panorama to the intimate close-up details around our feet. Now, for those of you who don't know, the range of hills I'm talking about, this is the Ockles. It's, uh, it's a panoramic ridge rising steeply from the flood plain down below. It's quite dramatic. Uh, it's uh, you get the, the road to St Andrews on the south side and the A9 to Perth on the, the north side of it. It's quite not quite as dramatic on the other side. It's a range of igneous rocks uh, formed from volcanic activity way back in depths of geologic time in the Devonian age. I reckon that's about what's say 410 to 360 million years ago. It's a fault line basically, and it's rising out a layer of sedimentary rock that's been laid down later. It was hot, mo hot molten lava reaching the surface and cooling, and it cooled into this dramatic formation of sculptured and eroded glens. And for those who are interested in the geology of it, it's made up uh, mainly of fine-grained andesite and basalt. The andesite's the greyish rock, and the basalt is a much darker, almost black in colour one. Now, King Seat Hill is there. It's that rounded summit. As you can see, there's a few peaks in there. It's on the right. It's a Donald, hence the title. I'm Davy. that's a Donald. Donalds are hills in the Scottish lowlands with summits between 2,000 and 2,500 feet and that's 610 metres in metric and over 100 feet in prominence so that's just about 30.5 metres. What I mean by prominence is a sort of a, this, a distance around it to the stand proud of the rest of the, the landscape. They were catalogued in 1935 by Percy Donald 
And there's a usual complicated formula to classify them. You get Donald Hills and you get Donald Tops. And then in 1995, there was an attempt to rationalize them and we've now got the new Donalds as well. Um, so however it's defined, at 648 meters, it's the third highest of the nine Ockel Donalds. Straightforward that we'll be following. We're going up from Tilly Kutri here on the, the south uh, scarp slope. <clears throat> and it's uh, puffing and blowing usually. And uh, they get to the top and they gratefully amble over the more level muir until the rounded ascent to the top of King's Seat Hill. It's more usually reached from Mill Glen in the western side of Tillicutri, where you see the quarry on the map there, or from Dollar to the east, which is off the map. The route up that we're going today is a lesser known one, and one I find really quite interesting. And it's quieter as well as uh, the Kirkburn Glen differs from uh, in form from the other Ochil, Ochil Glens. Now, this is how the OS map portrays uh, the landscape, but you can also find a different set of map, the Harvey's map, <clears throat> and it looks like that. <clears throat> and the difference in appearance is because of the contour lines. The OS have the five meter contour line and Harvey's map have 15 meter contour line. I find when I'm walking in New York, it's a cleaner uh, map to follow. That's just my personal preference. Uh, the other one gives, the OS one gives you a lot more detail in there. It's a matter of preference which you use, but I do recommend taking a physical map and compass uh, with you when you do go out and not rely solely on GPS uh, or other phone apps to, to guide you. They're convenient, but when they fail and the mist closes down the ochles and it does, then you need to be able to navigate your way off because that uh, southern escarpment is potentially dangerous. I mean, they're serious enough hills uh, to have a mountain rescue team with a base nearby, and that's, that's how sort of... Uh, so sort of abrupt that, that scarp soap is. So let's get started. That's where I usually start. It's a small car parking space by the old graveyard up the top end of Tilly. And you look at the woodland with the burn rushing through it. Uh, there's a Cicerone guide to it, but it gives an alternative starting point, but it makes no difference really. You join on the, the burn just a wee bit further up there. <clears throat> this route takes us up past an old uh, ornamental wooded walk to the side of the burn. And it's old, you can tell from the size of the yew trees there you can see on the left. Uh, these are a fairly substantial girth, but uh, dating yew trees is a pretty fuzzy business. If you look at the trunk, you can see there's a complicated bundle of uh, lobes winding around like a, a central stalk. It's, it's not a smooth part that you get with beech trees. I've seen pictures of a, a, like a 50 centimetre uh, diameter, equivalent to something like 250 years growth. So they are pretty substantial trees. They've been around for quite some time. And looking at old OS maps from the late uh, 19th century, it indicates a footpath up the side of the glen. And there are still large cobbles there that, uh, that line the route, so they've been around for quite some time. You see the burn to the side there. It's canalised uh, with stone sides and a bed, but it's not been maintained for some time. Some of the cobbles have been prized out by the force of water and lying in the stream bed, sort of breaking up the, the flow. As we move further up the glen, you can see that the sides steepen, uh, cutting deeply into the rock, and there's some really large boulders uh, wedged tight in the burn. The size of these one, they must be quite substantial. I mean, you're heading towards tons here. There might just be cobbles in there. The more formal on ornamental aspects are uh, less obvious, although you get large beech and sweet chestnut present in there. And it just shows the power of the water flowing down that narrow channel, uh, that it's cut deep in there. It's, uh, the rock is different from it is further up here. It's, it's, it's relatively softer going to the depth of that channel cut. And when you look at it closer, you can see that it's, uh, it shows bedding planes at an incline. Some are blocky and sort of ochre coloured, others are thin and dark. These are sedimentary rocks and they were laid down in the Carboniferous era and squished up at an angle. The burn was cutting its way through the ancient rocks and the fens and mosses find this damp environment in the increase humidity of that was a gorge uh, glen there. It's really quite so the place they like to live in, to be safe. So these are rocks are part of the coal measures and uh, they were laid down in estuaries and shallow lakes and seas. This is the uh, Clickmanishire coal measures uh, further down. Coal mining was quite popular in Clickmanishire in the past until it was all mined out and the mines became unproductive. 
and it shows the uh, uh, periods of eroded sediment lying on top of each other and compressed by deep time and then tilted by subsequent geological movement. You can see the pale blocks of sandstone at the top there overlying the sort of uh, darker sediments of siltstone and mudstone and the coal measures are further south uh, under, underlying deeper sediments in there. How I know this is that I find a, a map of a geology helps me understand the, the topography and the live of land. So I use this uh, iGeology app from the British Geological Survey. It's got the different rock types overlaid on an OS base uh, layer. And it gives you a basic understanding of the rock types, the uh, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic, and whatever. And I find that adds to the reading of the landscape and uh, it influences the vegetation, the clothing, the geological bones of the land. And it's through the mineral content and how that affects how plants grow, what plants grow there, and how they grow in this sort of land for. So I've something to use to with. But back to the glen and the woodland. And at this time of year, wildlife may be dormant and difficult to see, but present all year round are mosses and lichens. Uh, looking up close, there are a miniature ecosystem on the tree trunks and on the rocks themselves. This one here, uh, Forest Star, is one of the more common ones found in the, the humid conditions of that steep, uh, narrow burn. It's interesting, it's got a, a more upright leafy form than a typical sort of tight narrow uh, triangular uh, mosses that you'll see. So it's quite distinctive. Uh, if you look for it and you see that, that's what that will be for a star. So heading further up the slope, um, the burn to one side now, we come to the woodland that takes on a different character here. Here we get beech trees, many are self-seeded along with sycamore, and they cast a deep shade when in leaf. And what you can see underneath is there's very little ground vegetation here because the shade is so deep. It's still due to the layout of the leaves and the branches. The lack of light limits even the lichens, with only some common mosses and fungi able to survive, the, survive that shade. Now, staying with the mosses, there's two different growth forms in mosses uh, you, can, you can spot at this time of year. It's, uh, you've got the upright form here uh, with an unbranched stem. You find that in cushions. This one's Catherine's moss and it's got a wavy leaf in there. Then you get the spreading, branching ones uh, that covers rocks and trunks. They're mostly referred to by their Latin names, uh, uh, the scientific names, but some English names have been invented for them. This one's called uh, rough stalked feather moss, or as uh, most of us know it, uh, ordinary moss, because that's the most common one you'll see on the tree trunks and such like. But that's the two different growth forms you'll get uh, from mosses. So heading on further up the glen, we come to the head dike, the rustic gate to the hill path. The vegetation here you'll notice uh, makes an abrupt change from woodland to a much more uh, open aspect, shrubby and grassy, much more light than in the beach dominated woodland. And that shows the different land management uses. There's such an abrupt change in there. So there's a different type of management going on in that, in, in this bit of land. When we get our first sight, uh, proper sight of the classic Ochil Hill shape, you can see there on the, the top, uh, the hill at the top there, standing above the glen. And the path here is the desire line. There's a really dense bracken here, and that's closing the hillside. You can see how extensive it is with uh, some whin scattered through it, or gorse, it's another name for, for whin. And uh, you'll notice that the trees that we were coming through have missing. It's really quite an abrupt change. And I guess you will know the reason why uh, the trees are missing. Yep, it's the sheep. Sheep farming. Sheep are fairly fussy eaters and they preferentially browse the most palatable plants and that includes tree seedlings. And you'll find that the, the ewes are in the hill for a lot of the year, gathering only occasionally for tupping and shearing and lambing. So there's a lot of browsing goes on on those grassy hillsides. <laughs> and uh, you often find that when in bramble form dense prickly thickets that keep the, the larger herbivores away and provide shelter for tree seedlings to grow. But not here though, as the thick growth also provides shelter for sheep and deer against those sharp winds on the open hillside. They come belting in uh, from the southwest, it's really quite exposed there. So that's the ideal shelter for the sheep, but it doesn't provide the shelter for uh, the trees to grow. You can see here uh, from the angle of the slope, we've moved out of the sedimentary rocks where the woodland is and now onto the igneous rocks of the Ochil escarpment. The soil here are deeper and richer and further up slope and that's due to it just slumping down as gravity pulls the soils down. So you get more and more soil 
at the bottom of the slope. The bracken here indicates that soil is quite rich and trees could grow here naturally, but soil also supports a good bite of grass uh, for rough grazing. And that's in part due to the underlying rock, the andesite that I mentioned earlier, because the weathering of this rock releases minerals, it's quite a mineral rich rock. And these minerals in the soil are good for livestock nutrition. So the path here, as we head up the mid part of the glen, uh, becoming much more distinct here, it's a deep rut with banks. It's not just the sort of uh, the desire line that we saw earlier on. This is actually something that looks vaguely constructed. Uh, the land here is steeper as well, and uh, the going is harder. And it's around about here, I usually stop and take a wee breather and have a look around. Interesting, there's no running water in here. Um, the water will run down it, so it isn't a water course. And the natural burn lies to the right and down slope. And you also notice that the bracken has thinned out here. The soils are a lot thinner as we just got out of that, that bracken zone. So we're up into thinner, uh, more skeletal soils on here. If you look on uh, the Bing map here, you can see two parallel lines. The aerial photograph shows that those ruts or channels are running up the west side of the glen and the burn runs east of them, running diagonally down that's from the centre of the image. You know, also to the top left of the, of the shot, there's a straight line, that's a dike, uh, a stone wall, uh, high up in the hill, there's more of that soon. And also, look also to the scattered trees that you'll see to the right of the frame, and we'll touch up on that uh, soon as well. But it's quite a distinctive feature, uh, those two uh, channels that's got in there. You wonder, is that more than just the passage of feet? Was it something else? Was it there for transportation of something or other? Because there's quite an obvious feature in there. Who knows? But as we carry on up, uh, the, the path, the rocks and boys of the path, they're caused by small plants. Uh, the lichens are grey, looking a bit like the chewing gum you get in the pavement uh, or a dollop of porridge in the kitchen floor. And you get the green fur, the mosses, and if you look closely, you'll find up to maybe about a dozen different species of lichen and moss and grass living in the boulder. There's quite a, a diverse system lives on these boulders. And even when you look in closer, you'll see that you get uh, herbs uh, in here too, wildflowers, sheltering from the exposure to the wind and the rain and the sunshine and the searching teeth. This is thyme, the wild mountain thyme. And thyme likes a mineral rich soil, not acidic, so it's perched on top of a weathering boulder here and it's uh, protected from exposure. It's an ideal place to be. And if you were back in the past and you were wanting to collect your herbs for cooking, for culinary purposes or medicinal purposes, this is where you'd have to come to collect thyme because you wouldn't find it very much further south in the lowland part of Clickmanninshire. You'll only find it up on the hills here and top, perched on top of the boulder. So it's a bit of a hike to go and gather your herbs if you want to flavour your soups and stews or whatever. So this is the unusual feature of this particular Ochel Glen. Uh, other glens are deep incisions into the heart of the hills. The rocks gradually being eroded away over time at a constant rate. But a kick burn is different from having what looks like a head wall, it's more quarry-like as a band of harder rock stands, stands proud from the eroded section in front. This is a, is a geological uh, site of special scientific interest here. The geology here is made up of igneous rocks, the acid andesites and basalts that I mentioned, but uh, you'll see there's outcrops of diorite in amongst this. It's a slightly different rock type, the same family of minerals. And there they are there, uh, the columns of the, the diorite outcrops here. Diorite and andesite are similar sort of rocks. They have the same mineral composition and they occur in the same geographic areas. And basalt is a slightly different mineral makeup. But the interesting point here is in the granularity of the rock, the, the roughness of the crystals in here. Magma that is extruded, that's the stuff that comes into contact with air or water. It tends to cool quickly and the crystals formed are small. It cools down very quickly, so they don't have a chance for the large crystals to form. And that results in a fine grained rock. And intrusive igneous rocks like the diorite, uh, this magma that's been flowing through seams and sills and it's not exposed to air or water. So it cools down slowly and that allows time for larger crystals to form. So your diorite is therefore a rougher rock than the surrounding andesites. The same as granite, it cools slowly and it's quite a rough rock too. 
So it's cooled slowly in the cracks and fissures about 5 million years after the original eruptions. And 5 million years sounds a lot, but in, geo in geological time scale, that's hardly anything at all. So it just is a secondary exposure coming through uh, in the rocks. And below these diorite uh, outcrops, you can see in the scree, where the wind can get a foothold and the sheep can't, uh, the trees can grow. And here it's typically ash and uh, the rowan. But it's also a worrying time for the ash because there's a pathogen going around that slowly kills them, uh, a fungal pathogen. And it, uh, it sort of makes it lose its leaves and it gradually starves itself of the, the, the ability to, to photosynthesize. So it's quite worrying if we're going to lose. We lost elm and ash is looking a bit dodgy as well now. And its sycamore is probably taking, uh, taking its place uh, in that sort of ecological sort of uh, zone, as it were. Now, what else you can find on these trees is a, is a raven. If you look close, you see a little black shape of a raven perched in there. Um, they're commonly seen in the ocals, but they're easily confused with the rooks that swarm around the tree tops further down the glen. But they're easily told apart uh, when you look at the size of them and the sound of them as well. Um, the ravens have a gruff coughing call, a sort of pruck, pruck noise, and rooks are more of a nasal sort of ah, You'll, you know them when you hear them. And you can see them all year round along with buzzards. Both glide, but the, the buzzards have a broader wingspan. It makes that bit of soaring a bit easier for them. And <clears throat> back to the rocks again, with the wildlife that you see in January, this is mostly what you see. You get the crustos or the crusty lichens. They look just like the rock surface itself. There's, I mentioned the two growth forms of mosses. You get three growth forms of lichen, and they're all on this particular boulder uh, itself here. You get the crusty ones I mentioned, and that's that's those ones that look like uh, chewing gum. They can be grey, pale, yellowish, or greenish. And then you have folios ones, and they're the ones that look like leafy lich lichens. They have lobes that look almost like leaves, as you can see one in the middle of the picture there. And there they are there. Uh, there's a leafy one, and there's a, a shrubby, frickety a shrubby lichen. The leafy one's called uh, a parmelia, and it's popularly known as crottle. Uh, crottle, in the past, was collected and boiled and mashed, and it was used to make dyes. It gives a sort of reddish brown or a purpley dye for textiles, dyeing textiles. And uh, different uh, lichens produce different colours, as did herbs. So again, if you want to make your dyes for your, for your textiles, you'd have to come up here and gather the lichens to be able to make them back at home. So it's a fair trek to come and get your, your dye materials in there. And here we are at the top of the, the track as it flattens out about 370 metres. And it's here you pause, uh, take breath and have a look around, panoramic sweep. And if you see that sort of dark line at the top of the screen there moving past, that's that dike that we mentioned earlier on. And, and it pans around there and you see how the breaker slope is quite uh, substantial here. It levels out into a sort of muir on the top and it's got deep incisions into the, into the steep cliffs. And they seem to be more runoff channels than water courses. It's, the, the, water doesn't run, the, the water runs down that main burn, but the, these are little channels that just take the surface runoff and they gradually erode deeper down into that very steep uh, scarp slope. Um, it's mineral rich rock, there's a scope for plants to thrive in there if the sheep can't get to them, so it's good to go botanising in these uh, steep channels. Looking west to Wood Hill, the existing tree line's about 375 metres there, ash, sycamore, Scots pine, and if we note the tuscany vegetation here, uh, still grazing land, but it's not grazed the same intensity as the lower slopes where the sheep were hefted, it's much rougher up here. And there you can see <coughs> that it's an abrupt tree line. It's caused by a fence line that's not a natural climatic limit. The vegetation here reflects uh, land management choices. Trees either grow trees uh, for the crop or by excluding gra grazers or you restrict the tree, tree growth to the inaccessible steep ground and prickly bushes by choosing the economics of sheep. So it's an economic choice that shapes how the land forum looks, how the ocals look in the front of the ocals. That's that dike we mentioned, it's a substantial affair or it used to be until, uh, until it was allowed to decay and tumble down to be reabsorbed by the land. It's amazing how all the stones just vanish, be reabsorbed into the landscape. The dike marks a boundary of some description of ownership or land management, don't really know. So another of the signs that in the past, the land was much more extensively used up here. You often find that decline happened right about the time of the First World War. 
as uh, the men were off to war and many didn't return and the labouring force was reduced when folk came back. And here is a pretty common sight and upland boulders want to look out for. It's a special on dikes, it's the blood spot lichen and it's definitely a porridge flat one, not a chewing gum lichen. Uh, the red spots, the lichens, uh, fruiting bodies, releasing spores into the air to form a symbiotic relationship with algal spores. Uh, find a good bare surface to settle on and then set up home. And just look at the number of different lichens and mosses on this small section of wall. There's you can find dozens of different species on here. And it's quite an interesting thing to look for this time of year. The, the patterns, I don't even know the names of them myself, but I enjoy looking at the textures, the colours and the patterns of them. That gives me the enjoyment. Now here we are in the high muir, above 400 metres, with the higher tops behind. The track's obvious in the snow, and it's here in summer that you'll hear the constant trilling. And if you look up, you see the skylarks tethered like kites uh, in the wind. It's, uh, it's quite a welcome uh, view after toiling up that steep slope. You've got to amble across this open muir. And here's the law at uh, 636 metres. It's a familiar top to anyone who's walked the Ockles up to Ben Cluch. The uh, high point. Uh, interestingly, that is not, it looks like it's a Donald, but it is it's a Donald top. It doesn't have prominence. It's only got 20 meter prominence on the north side. There's a connecting ridge on the far side, which means it makes it a Donald because of its significant topography. And it's one of the caveats in there that makes Donald's uh, quite a complicated <laughs> system list and name. And another hill you'll see there is Andreganel, the second highest top at 670 metres. These guys are at 669 metres as the true high point lies about 150 metres behind there on the fence line. And it just doesn't have that same impressive view. So most folk come to look there and not actually on the top itself. I have no idea who Andrew Gannel was, uh, for the hills named after. A disputed story says he was someone who lost his life there, but old names call it Andrew Gannel, and it might not even be someone's name. Who knows? As you can see, more signs of agricultural evidence on there. And uh, the muir have been gripped sometime in the past, uh, put drainage ditches put into it. The straight dark lines indicate, indicate former drainage, and it's now blocked with soft rush. Drainage might be intended to create pasture with palatable grasses for livestock or to aid peat cutting for fuel. Um, it's abandoned now and nature's reclaiming it. To the left of that, out of shot, is a what looks like a, ro a, ro pardon me, a rock outcrop uh, and it's weathering away. But when you come, um, the rocks are dressed and it looks as though it could be part of a a sheep fank shaping contour of it raises some sort of thoughts that there could be a shielding or at least a shepherd's hut in there as well. In fact, there's, there's a sort of makes you think this is more for agricultural rather than cutting. Put those deep ruts in those up and down to use this as extensive grazing land. It's, it's very rough grazing now and it's not used as, as, as intensely it used to be in the past. That's the soft rush, and it shows how it influences the environment. Uh, it favours soil with a low to mid pH, and what it has is thick glutinous root mass, and that impedes water flow. And you can see the water backing up behind it here, and that creates conditions that uh, favour its expansion at the expense of other plants that don't tolerate such water logging. Uh, and it also inhibits plant decomposition if it's so wet in there. And that could be the start of peatland as well at a very early stage, where the plants die, they don't decompose because it's a deoxygenated environment, and they start to build up these plant layers, and that's where you get your peat from. Now you can see them right now, because uh, we're into coast. This is the ideal habitat for upland birds like your meadow pipits and your skylarks. And uh, wheat here as well, uh, they're a summer visitor. Wheat here will feed here, but they're more likely to nest in the rock of the tumble down fank nearby. The food tussocks provide. Grazing will take out the surrounding more palatable grasses and leave the tusks as shell uh, from predation. So the birds have to poke about in these tussocks to try and get the invertebrates, the insects, that, that's their food. So back on track, and you can see more evidence of past agriculture agricultural landscape with the cast iron fence posts here across the extensive moor. 
And uh, the tussock, the tussock grass is a great for voles too. It's good looking for volks in there. And that's what brings in your kestrels and your buzzards and your ravens looking for the small mammals. Here's blaeberry. Uh, blaeberry is usually what you call subservient to the heather. In this kind of moorland environment, you find more heather than you will do blaeberry, but you're very, you find it very often persists when heather's eyes are grazed out to the environment, becomes too cold for heather. Uh, the grazing limits heather growth and turns heathery moorland into grassy habitat. You've got a lot of grass here, so it's obviously been grazed a lot in the past, and heather is few and far between in the ochles. You're lucky to see it. So as we gradually ascend the sloping muir, we see a change in the sward. We head into the snow here. The tussocks seem smaller here, uh, less, rough, less rough, not a result of deeper snow. The snow remains as deep as it was, but it's uh, becoming more abundant due to the sort of, uh, environmental conditions, the, the climatic conditions. There's an altitudinal difference in sward composition. If you look at the hills, you'll see down the lower reaches a faded green. Hillside. And as you go further higher into the hills, a higher altitude, you get becomes more sort of bleached bone white. Uh, and that's the mat grass dominance with fine inrolled leaves. That's an adaptation to retain moisture in harsh conditions. You see that as well with the fescues, red fescues lower down. And up at this altitude, you find sheep's fescue, which also has tightly inrolled leaves. So that sort of bleaching effect of the, of the, the, the vegetation as you look up the hillside, is because of the, the mat grass becoming much more abundant, more dominant in, in, the, in the sward. And there's heath rush, it's a common upland rush, and that's indicating less waterlogged soils, but definitely more acidic. It's got different preferences to the soft rush. Uh, it's a smaller tuskly sward will have different vertebrate niches in here as well. There'll be fewer web spinner spiders and there'll be more wool spider. A different ecology here, a different ecosystem as you move slightly up the hillside. Still food for the birds though. So here's the view of the summit. It's a dome of basalt rock, much smoother than some of the surrounding land forums. Um, its basalt is a, is a more runny lava and it uh, cools evenly, whereas you'll find that uh, well, you can see a glimpse of the, the summit cairn in there, wee black dot. You'll find that the andesites are they're more viscous uh, and they're not so uniform as it cools, leaving a, a lumpier topography. So the lumpy bits are the andesites and smoother bits are the basalt. And there's the top of the, the harvest and burn, looking out across the, the, the plain of the fourth. An interesting feature on the hillside just about here, there seems to be a sort of lateral seepage line with these vertical flushes coming down. <clears throat> it's a seepage line. The water's either coming from the water table or from, uh, from waterlogged soils. Now, quite interesting. Here it is here on the map, and you can see in the map, it's just a, a line where the, the, the burn starts just slightly below that arrow in there. And when I go back to the geological map, interestingly, it shows a different band of rock in here. Uh, so this shows a, uh, that contour, there's a break in the geological make, the, make up the hillside. The pale pink oval that you see in there, that's, uh, that's the rounded basalt summit dome. And the bands of andesite are coloured blue and they're interbedded with this other rock. Uh, it's noted as being a conglomerate. Now conglomerate is derived from river and estuary, debris flow, cobbles, gravel, sand and mud. And that uh, <coughs> gets compressed into a sort of rough cement and gets deeply embedded uh, with other, other bedding planes in there. So that shows that these lavas were extruded into a water environment, like a shallow sea or lake of estuary, when you get these conglomerates of debris getting washed out of the, the, the hills uh, behind them. Continuity of rock structure allows water to spawn it from having about three official. So it's quite an interesting feature to pick up, and the, the geological map just sort of backs up the, the thoughts that, yeah, there's a seepage line in here and it is a geological fault. So, north of the spot is a complex saddle mire uh, straddling two watersheds and feeding three water courses. They all feed into the D River Devon, but at different points. One goes down to Tillicoutre, one goes down to Dollar, and the third one heads north from this point into what is now the Glen Devon Reservoirs and into the River Devon at the head of the Glen. So this would be actually where the start of the River Devon is. So it's quite interesting having that three-way watershed just up here. And it's, uh, it's a peatland up here as well. Uh, it's 
quite a spongy area, it holds water uh, as a storage service, soaks up rainfall and releases it by seepage into drainage channels and through the fissures and rock and it makes a, a slow runoff rather than having the water running fast and causing uh, flooding downstream. The peatland acts as a sponge and gently releases it and that's the importance of peatlands in the uplands why we need to have the peatlands in there because it is a flood control mechanism and it's a water purification mechanism as well so it's an interesting feature in the hills so if you're walking through a peatland next time don't start moaning about the bog think how valuable it is as a ecological service for people further down uh, down the glen now over the fence line here and it takes you uh, to the, the, the higher tops we hop over the fence and you on up to the summit it's one of those summits, you know, the type, uh, they go on and they go on and you reach the wee top breaker slope and you find there's another wee bit further on beyond it. And looking back, you can see there's a dark squall of cloud, dark squall of cloud coming this way. Nowhere to hide. So one of those exposed landscapes that you get uh, with the false tops. But don't worry, there's always something to see, distract your attention away from the, the coming squall coming up behind me. Uh, we patch of green and white. And in this, you'll see there's two very common upland mosses. There's the Politricum, common haircap moss, and the Plerosium, the red stemmed feather moss. I bet you, you can tell which one's which. <laughs> the red stemmed feather moss has a red stem, funnily enough. They're very common in the uplands and you should know them. Uh, you should see them anywhere you go. They're so common. So there we go, there's an oakle view looking back. Uh, it's the, the broad rounded summit of King's, of King's Seat Hill view in here. You'll notice uh, the wind scour up there is quite strong. You can see the grooves in the snow lying at the bottom there. And then look in the distance, here's our local wind farm. And so one of the rare conditions, bar thick mist, where the turbines uh, do actually blend into the landscape. <laughs> uh, it's a common feature in many hill ranges now. And if you look with the gap in the clouds there, there's a a view of the Persia Hills in the distance. This uh, thinks illuminating Ben Honze or Ben Ahoen or however it's pronounced. I've heard various pronunciations of it. I think we'll just glide over that one unless anyone's got an expert opinion on it. Um, and then it caught up with me, the squall of wind and snow whipping in and around. Uh, this slide shows one of the few areas of standing water. Uh, Frozen solid at this point, so I can't show you the sphagnum moss, which is the other uh, peatland form moss in there, but it's also good for uh, invertebrates and for birds, so it's there as part of uh, some of their, 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 their forage. There's water there for them, there's food for them, and it can bring the birds up onto the, the high plateau too. It's one of those deceptive perspectives where the summit cairn at 640 metres is lower than the actual top at 648 metres, which was somewhere around where the water was. There's a brief dip and there's a rise to this double cairn. And uh, here you can see it's a summit cairn, a double cairn here. The rocks are darker, that's the basalt, so that's that darker rock. And folk coming up through the route from Dollar may reach these cairns here and stop for the view uh, without actually achieving true summit. Uh, some people might be bothered about that, some people won't be bothered about that, they're quite happy to see the view, but uh, if you do like to actually hit the top, take look on the map to see what the actual summit is because the cairns may be deceptive. And uh, here we can pan round and take in the scenery at the top of the hill while the squall erupts around us. Uh, cut out the sound, you don't want to hear the sound, it's just a, a howling of wind <laughs> as I pan around. Can't see very much at the moment, but it's uh, it was quite interesting when it's, it's not quite so, so squally. You get these interesting gaps in the cloud as well when you actually see a distance. And here on this, the shining loops of the uh, River Forth, you can see the Concarton Bridge uh, and you have Grangemouth in the distance. Can't see Grangemouth at the moment with the oil refinery, looks like Mordor in the background there. But uh, if you want to see what the view is like, here's what I did earlier. That's what it looks like looking back across the high tops of the Ochels. And see the grass here is all very wind clipped and you can see that bleached uh, bone colour that I was talking about of the, the mat grass there, uh, just below the summit, uh, the cairn there. So the squall passes, the tranquil blue and white landscape returns, only the wind isn't particularly tranquil, but um, that's a trip up to the top of King Seat Hill. There's quite a lot to see still, so it's not just looking at the scenery, but there's still a lot you can take in on the, the, the vegetation and on uh, around 
uh, your footprints as you walk. Uh, not far from the path at all. We haven't really deviated much from the path to, up to the top there. And there's still plenty to see in sort of January. But before I go and take your questions, <clears throat> I'd just like to remind you that uh, we're a membership organisation. Membership matters. And if you're not already a member of Mountain Union Scotland, I would invite you to join. And uh, why? Well, it's reliant on funding from a combination of uh, membership descriptions and non-government grants and as well as receiving Scottish Mountaineer magazine, arguably, arguably the best climbing walking magazine in Britain, I would say, but I'm biased. Members receive a wide range of benefits, including membership card giving discounts, outdoor shops, places to stay, and other usual services, access to subsidised mountain skills courses, network of mountain huts, and winter access to Strathfarrer, and taking part in climbing competitions and so on. So there's a lot of benefits from uh, joining. And your membership supports the work we do in representing hill walkers, climbers, uh, winter mountaineers and ski tourers in Scotland, other campaigns too, which is my part of the, the job to protect access rights, mountain landscapes, and promote the responsibilities of access to the, to the hills and crags. So I'd like to thank you very much for your interest and sort of brief excursion into the Ochels. And if you've never been to the Ochels before, it's a great time to come and see them. Uh, even in the dead of the winter, the view from the past still has plenty to offer. So thank you very much for your, for your uh, your patience here. I'm going to, have to take some questions. I got a question first uh, this morning uh, from John McCarthy and John was asking me, reflecting on the experiences of large numbers of people going to the beauty spots, the hills in summer last year and the associated problems we heard cited by Scottish government and various other agencies, it would seem that 2021 we head in the same way. Has anything improved, uh, for example, improved parking and toilet facilities? And I would say, John, that uh, <coughs> Yes, uh, there is some work going on the way. People have realised it's a problem. Everyone's realised that we aren't going to Benidorm or whatever your favourite uh, point is, uh, Tenerife or wherever. So there will be a lot more people staying at home. And the Cabinet Secretary has actually convened a visitor management strategy group to look at this. That's a high level stuff. There's uh, three groups looking at it. You're looking at investment in infrastructure, prevention, regulation and reassurance, and education and marketing. So there's campaigns to let folk know about where they can park, how to behave, don't leave gates open, what's the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, all that sort of stuff as well. Also looking at the, the infrastructure as well, how do we manage parking? Because was a, you'll know yourself, we were out last, uh, last summer, parking could have been horrendous. So they're looking at uh, how we manage the parking. It's difficult to get more parking spaces in there because to build the parking spaces, you've only got a year to do it and you've got to put the money for it and it's a long-term solution. So there needs to be more uh, sort of boots on the ground and that's something that's been happening as well. Um, there's money being released by the Scottish Government for employing some more seasonal rangers over the summer. So yes, uh, things will improve and I also believe that uh, having in, uh, shares in port lose is a good thing at the moment because I don't think there's a port loo left to be had in Scotland. So that's been looked at, but it's still going to be quite tricky at times. So I think the application of common sense is going to apply as well. Uh, so have a plan B if you're into, out into the hills this summer, have a plan B, plan C, plan D, and maybe look at some of the lesser known places that you want to go to. So that's my suggestion for this summer is to sort of uh, take it easy and uh, try to avoid getting snarled up in the parking. Uh, looking at the questions here, Kina uh, Wildman asking me, how many times have I climbed this particular Donald? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> how many times this year? Last year, I climbed it a lot last year. I had nowhere else to go uh, due to traveling restrictions. So I was up and down the Ochils quite regularly. I like the Ochils. I don't have to go very far because I live in Tillicutri, so it's five minutes out my door and I'm up and doing that scarp slope. My knee's giving out, puffing and blowing like a good one, but it's a lovely place uh, to go walking. Um, can I recommend a tool for identifying mosses, says Heather. Uh, oh, that's a tricky one. Mosses are particularly difficult. There is a good book. Uh, it's by Carol Crawford and it's for woodland mosses, not so much for the upland mosses, but it's for woodland mosses. And, but a lot of them do, you, you will see in the upland environment. And it's Native Woodland Mosses by Carol Crawford. Uh, if you want to know, ask me, Heather, and I shall give you a link to it. <laughs> um, 
Rob Talbot is asking me, which walking map or maps for the Ochils would I most recommend? I say, well, it's a personal preference in here, really. You've got the Ordnance Survey map, <coughs> which gives you the five metre contour, which gives you a lot of detail. And you've got the, Harv the, the Harvey's maps, which gives you the 15, minute, 15 metre contours, and it's a much more open, uh, I find it a clearer uh, sort of map to work on. My preference is a Harvey's one, but it's up to yourself. Uh, have a look and see what you think is the best for your, for your own needs. Uh, buy them both. <laughs> you get enough money to do that sort of thing. But it's definitely a map rather than just rely on, the, rely on an app. <clears throat> yep, let me see. Susan Beach is saying, OS Explorer map shows a cairn at 480 metres. Do you know anything about that? Yes, I do. I've passed it many a time. It's a lump of stones beside the path. <laughs> That's all I can say. I don't know what it's there for. <clears throat> it may be a way marker uh, on that route, but I use the fence posts. The fence, uh, those, those cast iron uh, fence posts were there and they follow that path as well. So it may have been something to do with a marker of land ownership uh, when it was being used as a sheep run uh, in the 19th century. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but uh, <coughs> that's <laughs> that's as much as I know about it. I don't know very much at all. Yeah. Well, Alistair Jeff says, Fuel Studies Councils do a couple of sheets on mosses and lichens, which are good for the common ones. That's a good tip. I've forgotten about the, the FSC one, so thanks, Alistair. Uh, yeah, if you go to the Fuel Studies Council website, look on there. They do laminated ones as well, so you can take them out with you and you can get them damp and they won't just vanish into a, a soggy mush, which is really quite beneficial. And Fred is asking me, do I know the origin of twin cairns on the top? No, I don't know the origin. The, if you go further down, there's a plaque of where uh, an aircraft crashed into the Ochils. Must be some training exercise in the past that, um, that crashed in. Maybe the cairns were built at that particular time. But it's quite interesting to have the double cairn. It's not a usual feature, uh, going to twice the effort to have the two cairns. Uh, they're quite, quite broken down, but I don't know why specifically there is a double one there the information uh, the historical information can be quite difficult to find uh, on there um a lot of it was by word of mouth and wasn't really written down but uh yeah there's certainly a kid with a plaque in there i see i saw that plaque gleaming when it was come up from dollar one time i wondered what it was so that's what it was it was a uh, a plaque for the, the airmen there and there's also another plane crashed over at maddie moss on that call the, it was a watershed. I know someone who found the one of the sort of uh, two, one of the the, the, the sort of uh, instruments, the instrument panel uh, that he found lying beside one of the, the rocks up there where the plane had crashed. So yeah, there's there's lots of all sorts of stuff up there. Um, <clears throat> Martin is asking me, can I show my root slide again, please? <laughs> yes, I certainly can. Hang on, I'll just sh share that with you. Let's see if I can go back to that one. Way back to the beginning. There you go, that's my root up there. And it takes in, it's uh, uh, above the school, if you know Tillicutri, it's keep on pa go up past the school, there's a wee parking space up past there, uh, around the bend, there's no graveyard there, and it takes you up the glen, and <clears throat> up onto the, where you can see the dike, and then across, there's that cairn mapped on there, and it takes you to the King's Seat Hill that way. Most folks, I say, go up from uh, Mill Glen by the quarry, or up from the dollar end in there, but that's... <clears throat> Way that I go up. It's quieter, but uh, since lockdown, it's not been that quiet. It's a lot muddier now. And I think that's us out of questions at the moment. So thanks very much, everyone, for coming along. This is the first of uh, probably <laughs> uh, sort of uh, probably an intermittent series, maybe view from the path. Uh, depends how the lockdown goes. I'm not going to go very far for the next nine, nine weeks, given the, the information that's come out uh, today. So I may do another Ochel trip uh, next month sometime. Uh, got Daeglin Burn to Ben Kluch, uh, maybe taking in Arduni or somewhere like that. Uh, see how it goes. Um, I'll see what I can get away with. And if I can do another trip up the hills, maybe in the spring, summer, when there's something else to see, look at some of the birds, look at some of the plants, I might do that. And I'll share it with you when I do. Maybe even get a GoPro and have a video this time, so there's some slides. 
Okay. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for coming along. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, give you a bit of a view of what the Ocals are like. A great wee range of hills. And thank you very much for coming along. And maybe we'll see you again at another one of these ones. Great. Have a good evening. Thanks very much.